Everybody say those words with me. In God we trust. Just in case you don't know it, that's our national motto. It's on our coins. It's on our dollar bills and our other currency. It's our national motto. It became the law of the land in the late 50s. Most people don't even know this. Now, in the state of Florida, it's also our state motto, in God we trust. Amen? So people that say we're not a Christian nation, you're the one smoking something, not me. Okay? Okay, this is our heritage. This is our foundation. This is who we are. Okay? It's our national motto, in God we trust. Okay? Let's go. Let's go. Keep going. Push me, Rod. Here we go. Well, here we go. We'll see what we've got. Islam versus what? And I welcome the live audience listening this morning. Thank you so much. And I've had several uh, that have been away or they're here now because they've been watching online. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. You matter to us. And uh, I hope that when you have church with us online that you're just feeling like you're just part of us because you are part of us. Amen. And last Sunday morning we had over 30 watching with us. And uh, that's just a great amount of people that's hearing the Word of God. And we're just beginning to grow in that department. Amen, guys? We're just going to stay steady. That's what we do. Amen? Let's keep looking. Islam versus Christianity. There are approximately 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. Okay? 1.8 billion. There are approximately 2.3 Christians. 2.3 million Christians in the world. So you can see... You've got one and two right there. You've got one and two right there, okay? And everybody else is way down the line when you do the math and when you look at it. So Christianity, number one, population. Islam, number two. So it's, it's appropriate today the message says Islam versus Christianity. You understand? Because that's, that's, uh, that's what's going for the minds of our world out there today. The minds, the souls, the hearts of our people all over the world is this ideology which one will you trust which one will you believe what is Islam the word Islam say it with me means what means submission well that's appropriate isn't it the word Islam means submission keep looking so it's what submission to who and I want to make a note right quick I put Allah in small letters do you see that? Because there's one true God, okay? Jesus Christ, Jehovah God, okay? One true God. So I'm not going to break my faith by saying there's this God out there, okay? Y'all understand where I'm coming from, okay? Hope you understand that. So submission to Allah, so Islam is what? It's submission to Allah and His Word as revealed to who? Muhammad as recorded in the what? So that's what Islam is. Now, how difficult is that to understand? The word means submission, submission to Allah, as recorded to his prophet in the book called the what? The Quran. That is what Islam is. That's what it means. Keep moving. Islam officially began. I want you to know this. You ought to write it down if you can. Put it in your head. Islam officially began in 620 A.D. There was no Islam. You can read books down through the ages. You can go back. There's all kinds of uh, a historical record prior to 620. I know that was a long time ago, but it did not start uh, back in Genesis. It didn't start back with the, the Arabs way back when. It did not. Oh, there was all kinds of religions going on back then, but this wasn't one of them. Did you hear me? Yes or no? It's important that you know that. Okay, it started in 620, about 620. And by the way, you can go to Wikipedia. You're not going to some slanted website. To, oh, it started with... No, no, this is just common knowledge out there. So what's Christianity? And I could talk about this all day, but this is, this is me talking to you in plain English. What is Christianity? Christianity is the belief in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. In His what? Death. His what? burial and his what resurrection as recorded in what the holy bible that is christianity now we can talk about it does this and it does that and it does this but to be a christian you need to believe in jesus amen that's what christianity is believe his death burial and resurrection acts 2 peter speaking right after jesus had been crucified now he had ascended and now it's on them the early church 
Peter speaking, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know it. You saw him do it. You were there. Him being delivered by determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You've taken by wicked hands and you've crucified and killed him. You know you did that. This is Peter speaking. Whom God hath done what? Raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. That's Christianity. Do you understand that? This is who we are. A belief in Jesus Christ that he died. And he rose from the dead. Say that out loud with me. You need to know this because so much confusion. If I, I the, nothing like just, I always want to just hit my head against the wall <laughs> when people say, well, you know, it's, it's all about the same, you know, it's all about just God. You know, we're all on the same path. We're all on the same road. Yeah, that road's called hell. It's a point that a man wants to die and after this, the judgment. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you don't have to do a thing. You're condemned already. I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world, Jesus said. So yeah, the same path is we're all sinners on our way to hell without Christ. Amen? So I want you to understand clearly. Say that out loud with me. Islam and Christianity are not the same. Okay? Now that's the basis of my whole talk today, is that they're not the same. That's why you see verse up there. Islam versus Christianity. We don't put up that Islam like Christianity. No, we're going to look at what's the difference. And this is just me scratching the surface because if I did this too much, my head would explode. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? I can't do this all the time, but I can do it for you this morning. Here we go. Islam versus Christianity. So, the first place we need to go then is the Quran versus the Bible. Y'all understand? Yes or no? Are y'all with me? Y'all live? Yes or no? Okay, so if we're going to learn... We need to go there. So Islam versus Christianity. So let's look at the Quran versus the what? The Bible. So the Quran. The Quran means recitation. Say that with me. The Quran means recitation. You know what recitation is? It's to recite something to somebody. Okay? That's what the Quran means. Muslims believe Allah recited these writings to who? Muhammad because he was what? Don't forget that. Muhammad was illiterate. And this isn't me throwing stones or being ugly. This is the truth. This is what they know. And, this is, and his followers were illiterate. So this is what, this is what the, the Quran means. A recitation to Muhammad, these writings, because he was what? He was illiterate. These recitations to Muhammad took place, supposedly took place, over a period of how many years? Now get that down. Over how many years? Over 21 years to Muhammad reciting to him because he couldn't read. These writings were often in response to questions or crises in the community of what's called the faithful. They were over 21 per years uh, period. They were responses to issues struggles, things that came up in society, his society, his world that he lived, his followers that followed him. Does that make any sense to you? That's where they came from. So that, that's it. That's the Quran. That's it right there. You have it. 21 years means recitation from Allah to Muhammad because Muhammad couldn't read nor his followers. Took 21 years. Most of it According to what I've read is because of the community crisis, how to live, this, that, and the other, how to maintain, etc. Got it? The Bible. What's the difference? Well, the word Bible means what? Books. Actually, it means little books. And that's what your Bible is. A bunch of little books. It's also known as the what? The scriptures, the holy scriptures. Amen? Now, the Bible is a compilation of 66 books. You have 66 in your Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. These books were written over a period, say it with me, of how many years? 1,500 years by more than how many authors? 40 authors. You can't get two people in a room and line them up to say the same thing and to agree on anything. 
But the beautiful thing is about the Bible, not 21 years, but 1,500 years. Not one author, but 40. And though they say different things, same God. They agree. And though at times difficult to understand, it's not too difficult, to be honest. But I've never, read, I've never understood anything I didn't read either, okay? So you have to read the Bible to understand it, amen? But that's the difference between the Koran and the Bible, okay? That's the biggest difference right there, the period of time. The Bible was divinely inspired. Say that with me. The Bible was divinely inspired, or according to Scripture, the word is God breathed. And I want to I use this time to teach you as well some things from the Bible this morning. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, or God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in what? In righteousness or righteous living. For the prophecy, the Word of God, came not in old time by the will of who? Men. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, and that word again means God breathed. So that's our book, the Bible. Do you understand the difference? Yes or no? Let's do a quick review because it's important for me. Quran, given by Allah to Muhammad, who was what? Illiterate, and so were his followers. Over how many year period? The Bible, however, spans a period of how many years? 1,500 years. How many books? Written by how many authors? 40. And the Word of God, according to the Word of God, built right into this teaching of the Word of God, is that it is divinely inspired, it is God-breathed. Amen? Okay? That's the Bible. So, so let's look at it. The Koran versus the Bible. Are y'all with me? You're going to sleep on me this morning. Okay, good, good. Come on, it's America. We can talk like this. Amen? Say. And I'm not trying to be ugly. I haven't been ugly. What I've said is truthful. Yes or no? Okay? The Koran versus the Bible. Let's look at it. Now, according to Muslim scholars, and I ain't one, according to Muslim scholars, one must know Arabic to fully understand the Koran. To fully understand the Koran, and one must know Arabic, according to scholars. The Bible, however, is universal. It's been translated into over 531 languages, and it can be read in these languages without excessive commentary. If people can get a Bible and they can start reading the Bible, they can understand the Bible in their own language. That's a big difference between the Bible and the Koran. Did you just hear me, yes or no? Let's do a quick test. How many, you started reading the Bible, wait a minute, you started reading the Bible and you didn't know a lot about the Bible, but you started reading the Bible and God helped you and you started to understand the Bible and you became a Christian, you started following the Lord. Is there some in the audience like that that did that? Can I see your hand? I started reading the Bible. I got interested in the Bible, started reading the Bible. You probably didn't understand it when you started, but you read it. Okay, it's not so important, guys, that you like read 30 chapters every day so you can brag to somebody. If you need to read just a little bit, chew it up, chew your food, amen? Come on, just read it. Hide God's Word in your heart. Here I was, a hellraiser who squat about nothing in the Bible, and I ended up, look at me, a preacher. Are you kidding me? So listen, if he can do that with me, he can certainly do that with you. Amen? Come on. Keep reading the Word. That's what we do. The Koran. External sources called Hadiths and Sirahs. You'll see that a lot if you look into this stuff. Are necessary for what? Now what does that mean, Hadiths and Sirahs? These are writings that came after this 21-year period that the recitations took place to Muhammad. These are writings that came even hundreds of years later that go back and tell things that happened. So it's people after the fact telling you what happened and things that happened because those things that happened ain't in there. Does that make sense? 
Much of that's what that is. And so you need these to help you fully understand. You understand? How can you understand when you don't know what happens? You know, and so you need this over here, which is written later. It helps you understand this. The Bible, huge difference. The historical context is contained within the text. Did you hear Peter speaking a little bit ago? You were there. You saw his miracles. You killed him with your own hands. Did you hear Peter say that? And when you look at the Bible, so many historical events happened. Now, people have doubted them for years, only to become a fool later when it was proven. Amen. So, so much historical evidence, so many things historically happened. Places, kings are mentioned that actually existed. And this is over a 1,500-year period, guys. This isn't over 21 years. So the beautiful thing about the Bible is that the historical text is contained. The Apostle Paul, 13 books in the New Testament, he tells you where he went. He tells you where he was sailing to. He tells you the people that, were, that he was preaching to. You remember? Went to Greece. He went to Rome. He went to Colossae. He went to Ephesus. These are real places with real people. You understand? He mentioned real kings. So that's a big difference with the Bible. The historical context is within it. You don't have a book 300 years later telling you, oh, by the way, this is what happened, even though it wasn't in there. Now, we can get help from other books for sure. Other history books come along and maybe bring light to a situation, but the historical context is within the text. Keep looking. The Koran. There are many, many disagreements between the Koran and the Bible. All right, and I actually had three minis. Many, many, many. Got that? Yes or no? I could take the rest of my life probably and make a career out of just showing the differences between the Koran and the Bible. But I'm not going to do that, okay? Because again, I would jump off a bridge or something. I'm not going to do that, okay? I'm going to teach the word to you guys. However, I'm going to hone in on just one part department this morning, okay? There are many different, okay? Even though the Bible, listen to this, even though the Bible, now you got to get this math in your head. The Koran was written about 620 A.D., after the death of Jesus. Amen? That's a long time. That's about, that's over two times the length of America being a nation. Amen? Say, that's a long time. Okay, so 620 years later, the Koran is written. All right? So you got to do that in your math. So, even though the Bible was written 2,100 years or 600 years to 600 years before the Quran. Does that make sense to you? Yes or no? Even though it was written 2100 years or 600 years before the Quran, Islam still insists what's written in the Quran is what? So when the Quran talks about the Bible or talks about things from the Bible that's different, that's totally different or odd or they missed it. Whoa, it didn't say that in the Bible, but it you know, sort of said it, but it didn't say it that way. That's different. Well, they say what is in the Quran is absolutely correct and what's written in the Bible has been what? I'm going to tell you something, guys. Satan has used this because unbelievers, that's what they say. That's what unbelievers say. How can you believe the Bible? It's been written by so many men over so many years. It's full of so many errors. Well, that's exactly what the Koran wants you to believe. Did you hear me? Yes or no? Say that next time. Yes or no? Okay? Am I going to believe a book written 21 years to a fellow couldn't read? 600 years after the fact. Or as long as 2,100 years after the fact. Or am I going to believe a book written by 40 authors over 1,500 years that is historical in its context and doesn't need writings after the fact to come and fill in all the blanks. Did you hear me or not? Guys, that's, that's who we are. Amen or oh me? Come on. Now, I'm honing in on one spot because I can't go all over the place on all these disagreements. And this is a big deal. The Koran... I'm not saying because I haven't read it from cover to cover, guys. But generally speaking, with great conviction, the Koran is void of moral values. You need to know that. Void of moral values. Now, what do I mean? Let's, before we put anything else on the screen, right? When you think of the Bible, we call it the good book. Do we call it the good book? Some people call it the good book. 
And you can't think of the Bible without thinking of moral values. Did you hear me, yes or no? If I said to you, the Bible doesn't have any moral values, you'd go, what? You have really been smoking, preacher. Come on, man. Bible's full of moral values. Let's look, let's look. Void of moral values, full of moral values. Okay? The Quran permits lying. I'm not saying it's telling everybody to be a liar, but it permits lying. You know what the Bible does not do? It doesn't permit you to lie. Do you hear me, yes or no? Plain English, say it with me. Thou shalt not what? What command is that? Somebody tell me, it's number what? Nine, good, get the video. Number nine, balloon on a stick, little girl light on the balloon, pop. Here we go, keep looking. Get the video. If you're watching online, you just write us. I'll send you the video for free. You'll get the, you'll get the Ten Commandments video for free. See, it's, it's paying off for you out there. Here we go. The Koran is void of moral values. It permits what? Stealing. And guys, we could put scripture after, uh, not scripture, but writing after writing up there where they said this, but it permits stealing. The Bible says thou shalt not what? It's not stealing a moral value, yes or no? We teach that whether you're a Christian or not. Don't steal it. That's not yours. Yes or no? Don't lie. Tell the truth, Johnny. Right? Come on. Advocates fighting. All throughout, you can find many, many, many of these sayings about fighting. Jesus said what? Love your enemies. Okay? It's raining. We're inside. Amen. Come on. Here we go. Instructs men, listen to me, to do what? Beat their wives. Now look, it doesn't instruct them to beat their wives right away. You know, this way, talk to them, this, that. There's many things before beating your wife is part of it. Okay? Beating your wife is not a moral value. Y'all hear me, yes or no? Okay? And I could have given a whole message today on just the way Islam looks at women. Okay? And I don't want to go there because there's so much I'll get sideways. Okay? I'll get off track. What's the Bible say? Husbands do what? Love your wives. As who? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's what the Bible teaches. The Koran advocates and extols, that word extol means praises, violence. Okay? You might say, boy, clerk, you're being tough on the Quran. I'm not being tough at all. It is what it is. Okay? It, it, it advocates and extols violence. I know you're like me. You watch things that happen. You watch how women can be treated like this. All they get is a little space to look through their head. Amen. Yes or no? Takes four men to... Uh, you know, to, to testify if she's been raped, okay? And if she's been raped by somebody that's not a Muslim, it's, you, you know, you have a hard time even getting a conviction at all. How do these things happen, okay? You see the things on television. Well, when something advocates and praises violence, you're going to get what? You're going to get some violence. And there's going to be others that are going to take it to a, a big extreme. But the book itself advocates that. Did y'all hear me, yes or no? Well, that's not, that's their peace loving. It's not in the book. That is a lie. It is in the book. Own it. If you say you believe it, then just own it. Don't tell me I've got the problem, okay? Violence is a what in the Bible? It's a sin. Guys, there's never an excuse. Ladies, there's never an excuse for you to get somebody and choke them. Got it? Yes or no? I don't care how you feel. We're not talking about protecting yourself, guys. We're not talking about that. We're talking about moral values, the way that we're to live. We're, our homes aren't to be violent. Yes or no? We're not to be violent with our neighbors. We're not to be violent with unbelievers. Well, there's somebody that doesn't go to church. I'm going to go over there and beat them up. That's the dumbest thing. That's stupid. Yes or no? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it's written, say it with me, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Have you ever had to, you wanted to hurt somebody, but you didn't, and you had to just turn that over to the Lord? Say, that's just the truth, guys. Come on, we're not called to be violent. Y'all right or not? 
Is the rain putting you to sleep on the roof? Here we go. Therefore, if your enemy, what's that word? Therefore, if you're what? Enemy, your enemy hungers, feed him. For in doing so, and, and for if he thirsts, give him what? Drink. For in doing so, you'll heap what? Coals of fire on his head. What does that mean? That just means if you feed an enemy instead of hitting an enemy, if you love an enemy instead of hurting an enemy, you know, there's a great opportunity that they're going to see your love. Maybe not. They might take advantage of you, but that's still what we're going to do. That's the scriptures, yes or no? Amen. Be not overcome of what? Say that with me. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Amen. Keep looking. Advocates killing. Is killing advocated in the Quran? Yes. What's the Bible say? Thou shalt not what? What command number is that? Tell me, number what? Number six. Good. Get the video. You'll learn them. 30 minutes, guaranteed. Amen. In the Quran, killers are martyrs. So people killing for the sake of Allah or they holler jihad, they are then what? Martyrs. You saw it this week in Turkey. You're seeing it again in Bangladesh where a couple of our own college kids were killed from Emory University. Okay, you saw it over here in our own state in Orlando at a, at a nightclub. Are you hearing me? Messages sent, not to Jesus. Messages are sent to Allah or Jihad. Yes or no? Okay, so, and they become martyrs. And you see other people praising them or extolling this violence. You got it, yes or no? The Bible killers are what? You're evil. Okay? God created mankind, all men, women, in His image, in His likeness. Blood is precious. Blood is so precious, the Bible says, if you take blood, your life shall be taken. That's God's position. He loves life so much that He'll take your life if you take someone else's life. Did you hear me? Is that a big difference? Yes or no? God's not telling you to go out and kill people. God's telling you to go out and love people. And he's making it plainly clear, if you kill people, I'm going to take your life. Amen? Shedding innocent blood. We're not talking about wars. We're not talking. That's another topic for another day. We're talking about us, guys. We're talking about living your life. Amen? Say. Okay? Martyrs are killed for their faith. They're not killers. Say that with me. Martyrs are people who are killed for their what? They are not what? Somebody who kills somebody is not a martyr. Did you hear me? You are not a martyr. You are a killer! A martyr is somebody like Ignatius who was a follower of Christ and he was put to a stake and lit on fire and instead of Ignatius he was singing hymns to the glory of God. That is a martyr. Amen? A martyr, in my view, is someone like my own mother who lived with a man who was the devil. My stepdad. And she lived a consistent life. She was not perfect, but she lived a faithful, consistent life. And he shot her six times with a 357 Magnum. And I think my mother's last words as she was looking down that barrel was, you can't threaten me with heaven. That's the view I have of a martyr. Somebody faithful. Somebody who's good. Somebody who's serving. Somebody who loves the Lord. Somebody who doesn't turn their back on their faith. Did you hear me? Yes or no? Martyrs are not killers. Killers are killers. Is that a big difference between the Bible and the Quran, would you say? Absolutely. I see you, buddy. I know I'm, I'm late back there. Good thing we got two services on this one. The Quran's greatest commandment, what is it? Here's their greatest command. Belief in Allah and Jihad. In his cause. That's their greatest command. Belief in Allah and jihad in his cause. Amen? Whatever you need to do for his cause, if it extols Allah, praise it, good. That's their greatest command. What's the Bible's greatest command? It's to love the Lord and to love people. Okay, at Fellowship Church, we say it this way. We love Jesus and we love people. I wanted when we started fellowship to put Jesus there. I don't want any mistake about it. I could have said we love God. We do love God. But if you don't love his son, 
God says, you have no part of me. I gave my son for you. You love me, but you're bypassing Jesus. We're not going to bypass Jesus here. We love who? Jesus. And we love who? People. That's what the Bible teaches. Look at, look at the scripture. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and what? Great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love your who? Neighbor as who? Yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the laws of all the prophets. Amen? Even the Ten Commandments. The first four are really about loving God, serving God, believing in God, trusting God. The last five, from honor your father and mother all the way down to not coveting something somebody else has, is about people. It's consistent through the Scriptures. You hear me? Amen? So, that's a big deal. Did y'all hear what I just said this morning? Now I could go on and on and on. But is there a difference between the Bible and the Koran? Yes or no? A big difference. Can we thank God for His Word loudly? Come on. And guys, let me say something to you. That's why you need to read the Bible. If you're not reading the Bible, you know, that's on you. That's not, uh, that you just need to read the Bible. You need to start reading the Scripture. You need to start reading a little bit. You need to take this as a kick in the rear today. I need to read the Word. Are you kidding me? 1,500 years, 40 authors, 66 books. Historical in its context, has moral values. Of course, it teaches salvation and all that other good stuff too, amen? Absolutely. It's huge. Muhammad and Jesus Christ. And we'll try to make it through this, Raj. Okay? We're going to do our best. Muhammad and Jesus Christ. If we compare Islam versus Christianity, the Quran versus the Bible, then we must talk about Muhammad versus who? Jesus. Muhammad. He said, I've been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Jesus. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. He told that to Peter. Remember when he cut off the ear? Put, your, put away your sword, Peter. This is not how we're going to overcome evil. It's not going to happen this way. Put up your sword. Muhammad beheaded 800 Jewish men and boys. Who you want to follow? Jesus beheaded nobody. Keep looking. Muhammad murdered those who insulted him. And by the way, you insult Muhammad today, and you're put on a death, you're put, put on a list to get killed. You understand that? So you write something. We've seen it happen in the news media. We've seen it. We probably we don't know what's happening out there, to be honest with you. Okay? In our world. Jesus didn't murder anybody. He preached what? He preached forgiveness. Actually, he allowed him, his own self to be murdered. Yes or no? For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us a what? An example that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, insulted, he did not revile or insult again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. God be praised. Who his own self bear our what? Sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross, that we being dead to sin should now be able to live how? Unto righteousness by whose stripes we're what? Heal Jesus. Is there a difference between the two? Are you seeing the difference, yes or no? Big difference? Mohammed, if then anyone transgresses the prohibition against you, transgress ye likewise against them. Jesus, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the what? The other cheek. These are scriptures whether you know the Bible a lot or not. You remember this, don't you? Sure. Don't resist evil, but whoever shall smite you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. Right from the scripture, and pull it right up, let you see it, boom, just like that. Muhammad, jihad is the way of Allah. No, excuse me, jihad in the way of Allah elevates one's position in paradise by a hundredfold. So if you commit jihad in the name of Allah, you have 100 times more chance to make it to paradise. The Bible, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the what? Not people being violent, killing people, 
beating people, imprisoning people, but people who are bringing peace. And the gospel is the gospel of peace. Amen? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I just want to say something about that last one, and that is 100 times. See, in Islam, there's no guarantee that you're going to go be with Allah. It's a works-driven religion. It's not faith-driven. It's works. This is what you do. This is what you do. But if there's something in there that gives you a hundred times greater chance of getting there, why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you do it? If you could hurt somebody, kill somebody, blow somebody up, and then they've, they've sweetened the pot up there with all the virgins. You hear me? Yes or no? You hear this on, you hear it just as well as I do, right? Well, it's right there in the, in the book. Muhammad married 13 wives and kept sex slaves. Jesus was celibate. Is there a difference between the two? Oh, Muhammad, Jesus, it's just the same. Oh, the Quran, oh, the Bible, it's just the same. Oh, Islam, Christianity, it's just the same. Oh, God, Allah, they're the same. They're not the same. Is this above your head or are you getting it? Yes, yes or no? Good. Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old child. I think they were married at six, though. He married her at six. That's what I've heard three years later. Consummated the marriage at nine. Jesus didn't have any sex with kids. Did you hear me, yes or no? I think that's a good line to say to somebody. Jesus didn't have sex with kids. Is that all right? Is that fair to say, yes or no? Jesus said, whosoever shall offend a little one of these that believe in me, it's better for him that a 2,000-pound millstone was put about his neck and he was cast into the sea. That's Jesus' belief. This idea that Jesus is mamby-pamby. Now listen, he's strong, he's loving, but he's strong. You hurt a child? Put a 2,000-pound, put a ton around your neck and bury you in the sea. Amen or amen? Amen. That's how I feel, by the way. Okay? Mohammed ordered the murder of women. Jesus never what? Never harmed a woman. Matter of fact, he put himself in a position to get harmed because he stood up for women. I can name so many. The woman in adultery, the woman at the well. When he was at that home with the Pharisee, that woman came in and started washing his feet with the tears, remember? And they said, if you knew if this was a sinner woman, a prostitute, you wouldn't let her do such a thing. He stood for women. Muhammad, oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Fight unbelievers. Be hard. Jesus, blessed are the who? Meek. Meekness is strength under control, not hardness. I'm being a good Christian because I'm being hard. No, you're being an idiot. Excuse me. Hello? Jesus wants us to love. He made us who we are. We have our personalities. I love sports. I like being tough. Amen? But if it ever crosses the line where I'm mean and I'm hard, then I'm wrong, not him. Amen? Keep looking. Ordered 65 military campaigns. He was a, he was a warrior. Raided in, in raids in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years he did this. Mohammed did. Jesus ordered no military campaigns, nor did he offer any approval of war or violence. Do you understand that? That's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus became poor that you through his poverty might be made what? Rich. That's why he came. He didn't come to run militaries and give military orders. That's what they wanted out of him. That's why I believe many of them turned on him when he came into Jerusalem. Save now! Save now! They didn't realize his plan was to lay down his life for us so that we could have everlasting life. Muhammad encouraged his men to rape enslaved women. 
never encouraged rape, never enslaved any woman. This is, a, this is a sharp contrast, isn't it, today at the Fellowship Church? Yes or no? It just is what it is. Muhammad was never tortured. He was never tortured, but he tortured others. There's a difference. Jesus suffered what? Torture, a horrible torture. But he never what? Never tortured anybody. That's your Savior. I hope you love Jesus more because you've been seeing him today. And so, yeah, we ought to praise the Lord. I hope you love your Savior. This is who we're called to be, just like him. Now, according to several different things that I read, Muhammad died fat and wealthy from what was taken from others in war and that he demanded from others in tribute paid to him. That's how he died. Of course, they'll tell you, you know, he was on a horse and he flew off of, uh, you know, right there at the Temple Mount. I'm here to tell you, I don't believe that. Jesus Christ demanded nothing for himself. And he died without what? Not even a tomb to be buried in. Not even a grave. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. Does the Bible say that? Absolutely. Is there a difference between Muhammad and Jesus? Absolutely. He advocated Muhammad did crucifying others. That's what he did. Jesus Christ was crucified himself for you. Behold, we go to Jerusalem, Jesus said. Son of man's going to be betrayed. The chief priests and the scribes, they're going to condemn me to death. And they're going to deliver me to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. But the third day, I'll rise again. Amen? That's the gospel. John 19, he bearing his cross, he went forth into a place, the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, and I've been there, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side and Jesus in the middle. So he was crucified for us. Is there a difference? Islam versus Christianity, we're moving, keep moving, okay? Muhammad's followers, and we're going to try to do our best. Are y'all, you're going to live, right? You're with me okay so far? I mean, this is hard on me, but I don't want to stop when I've studied. I want to nail this to the wall so we can say, absolutely, we got it. You all right? If your roast burns, just whatever. We'll be fine. Muhammad's followers and Jesus' followers. Let's look at them. Muhammad's followers were called what? Pop it up. Warriors, Jesus' followers or disciples, are called what? Is there a difference? We're to war against the wicked one. We're to fight against the devil. Yes, we're not to war against one another. We're not to war against other people. That's not, he's called us to serve other people. Is that true or false? True. Muhammad's followers. Muhammad had others give their lives for him. Jesus gave his life for him. Others, totally different. Jesus said to Peter, put up your sword and your sheath, etc. We already said that earlier. Keep looking. His followers, their emphasis was on jihad or the way of Muhammad. That's what jihad means, the way of Muhammad. So the way he did it, we'll do it. He who fights that Allah's word should be superior fights in Allah's cause. Jesus said emphasis was on evangelism, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them, we'll do it tonight, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Amen? Total difference. Muhammad's followers attacked and conquered the populations in parts of 28 modern countries in just the first three decades after his death. Jesus' followers did not resort to any, any violence of any sort after his death, and they were tremendously persecuted, and most of them were martyred for their faith. Is there a difference? Big difference. Muhammad's followers plundered and lived off the wealth of others. Jesus' followers gave away their possessions, Acts chapter 2, to those who were in need so that others would not lack. Is that true? Absolutely. Are we still to live that way? Absolutely. We took an offering up this morning to support this ministry. We're not asking the federal government to write us a check to run this place. 
We're Christians. We believe in getting the gospel out and loving on people. Yes or no? Absolutely. That's who we are. Mohammed's followers captured and enslaved non-Muslim people. Jesus' followers considered themselves to be the slaves of other people. We're bond slaves. I'm your brother. I am your server. I am to serve you. That's the belief in Christianity. That's what Jesus taught. Keep looking. Keep pushing. Thank you. Now, we're moving. We're going some new territory. The last days. Now, set up, guys. I'm telling you. The last days. Islam versus Christianity. The last days. Islam. The Mahdi, M-A-H-D-I, is one who is going to be Muhammad's successor, according to the Quran and the different writings, the Hadiths, the Sirahs. The Mahdi will come. He will come in Muhammad's name. He will be Muhammad's successor. He is their ultimate good guy. Say good guy. The Mahdi will return. He will fill the world with justice and peace. This is what Islam teaches. Shia Islam, because there's different branches, and that's how they seem to t make excuse for these others. Oh, it's this branch, and this branch believes this, and this branch believes But it's interesting, all their book goes back to the Quran, though. It's because they hate each other. They're fighting and hating each other in the same name of the same God, supposedly. Shia Islam, it just struck me as weird, man. They call this Mahdi coming back. They call this the what? Occultation. To us who are believers, what does the occult represent? Satan. This is their good guy. This is the guy they literally call him coming back the occultation. That would be, if I was their PR guys, man, we need to change that one. Christianity teaches that the Antichrist will be revealed. Now, I want you to see something. This is their good guy. The Bible, the Antichrist, is the what? Bad guy. So Islam, the Mahdi, good guy. Christianity, the bad guy, evil in the last days. The Antichrist is one who's against and opposed to Christ. That's what that means. He's against and opposed to Christ. He's against and opposed to Christ. That's what the Antichrist is. Little children, in the last time, as you've heard, the Antichrist will come. Even now, there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time or the last days. Who is a liar? But he that denies Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that that man of sin or Antichrist be revealed otherwise known as the son of perdition. So the Antichrist will come. That's the bad guy, correct? Yes or no? But the Mahdi Islam, that's their what? So let me get this straight. The Mahdi's going to come, successor of Muhammad. He's going to execute justice and peace. Yes, that's, that's exactly what it says. Yes, yes. Okay, he's your good guy. Absolutely. The Bible talks about the Antichrist will come, bad guy. Right? Yes or no? Yes or no? So let's compare their good guy to the Bible's bad guy. See what we come up with. The Mahdi, head of one world government, head of one world government, sets up Islam as a world religion, leads a one world religion, upholds a three-year treaty between Jewish and Gentile world, confirms a three-year treaty between the Jewish and Gentile world. Rules approximately for seven years. Rules approximately for seven years. The same white horseman from Bible Scripture is used by Muslim scholars as evidence of the Mahdi in the Christian Bible. If you get my Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, you'll see the way that I teach it. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the guy on the white horse, dun -dun 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 ain't the Lone Ranger. He conquers through diplomacy through treaties, through politics. Described in the Bible as the white horseman of the apocalypse. The Mahdi invades and conquers Israel and Jerusalem. The Antichrist invades and conquers Israel and Jerusalem. The Mahdi rules from Jerusalem. The Antichrist rules from Jerusalem. 
I'm getting confused. I thought that was the good guy. Yes or no? Are you seeing it? The Mahdi focuses his conversion efforts on Jews and Christians and kills those who will not convert. Targets and persecutes Christians and Jews and who do not convert. Implements Sharia law and the use of Islamic calendar. Changes the laws and the calendar. Assisted by ISA, ISA, or the Islamic version of Jesus. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus is in the Quran. They write about him 600 years later. It's a lot different. Some of it's similar. But he's not the one coming. No, the body is. Jesus gets to help him. Did you hear me? The Antichrist is assisted by the what? False prophet. Now, if you don't know this, read the book of Revelation. It's tough. I'll admit it. Get the four horsemen of apocalypse. That'll help you. The Mahdi granted special powers from Allah to perform signs and wonders. The Antichrist granted special powers from Satan to perform signs and wonders. Arrives on the scene during a great period of turmoil caused by war, crime, natural disasters, and religious apostasy. Arrives on the scene during a period of great turmoil caused by war, crime, natural disasters, and religious apostasy. Is your head spinning? I knew when I put this up, your mouth would be dropped open, and it is. But let's talk about the Mahdi's helper, which is Jesus, Isa, and the false prophet. Isa, he governs alongside the Mahdi, governs alongside the Antichrist, the false prophet. He's subordinate to, to the Mahdi. He's subordinate to the Antichrist. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus subordinate to anybody? Now, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, things under the earth. Amen? Y'all with me so far? Hang in here. Isa, chief enforcer of the Mahdi's policy, Sharia law and Islamic religion. So let me get this straight. Jesus comes and enforces Sharia law. That's exactly, that's right. That's what they say. The false prophet, chief enforcement of Antichrist policies, law, and religion. It gets worse. Isa serves as the executioner of the Jews and Christians who do not convert. Does that sound like you're Jesus? Does that sound like something Jesus would do? Kill the Jews and kill his own followers? Is that something Jesus would do? I hope you'll never say ever again, Oh, they're the same! You know, all roads lead to heaven. Try not to let me be near you when you say it. Amen? Come on, you're, you're, you're accountable now, guys. The false prophet serves as the executioner of Jews and Christians who do not convert. Isa claims to be Jesus, the Lamb. But he acts the contrary. The false prophet, a descriptive clue to his identity, is given as a dragon in sheep's clothing. Isn't that wild? Keep looking. Isa abolishes Christianity, Judaism, and all other religions. So let me get this straight. Jesus comes, helps the mighty, subordinate the mighty, kills Christians and Jews, and then he abolishes his own Christianity and Judaism. Does that sound like the God of the Bible? No. Abolishes Christianity, Judaism, and all other religions. That's the last days. Now we're almost done. Not quite. This is the 4th of July weekend we're celebrating. Islamic states versus the, versus the United States. And I'll rattle through this as well. Islamic states across the world, by the way, 70% of all refugees, if that doesn't show up, I want you to remember that, are from Islamic states. But I probably got it right here. I want you to know something. The United States is a Christian nation. We would not be who we were if we believed what they taught. Did you hear me say? You need to know that. Come on. Well, and our president went on foreign soil and saying the United States is not a Christian nation. Maybe he meant well to have all people know that we welcome all people. But get it straight. We're a Christian nation. Okay? Come on. All you got to do is look. Look at the rest of the world and look at us and say, which one looks like the Christian? 
Amen. I'm not saying we're perfect. We're not. We got all kinds of screw-ups. But we are a Christian nation because we were based on Christian principles, and that's why we are who we are today. Come on. Countries, Islamic State, these are countries that people want to escape from. Have you noticed or not? 70%. You need Say 70%. You need to know that. 70% of the world's refugees are coming from America. 70% of all the world's refugees, this peaceful religion, is producing 70% of the people who are being slaughtered, getting on boats, living in tents, living wherever they can live. Does that sound like Christianity? The United States of America is where people want to escape too. Can we thank the Lord for that? Come on, we want to praise the Lord for our country. Come on. Right here. We're celebrating our country. Islamic states jailed, persecuted, or beheaded for any other belief other than Islam. Period. Now, you might not be beheaded in every country, but I guarantee you're going to be persecuted or your butt's going to end up in jail. In America, you have religious freedom. Can we thank the Lord? Come on, praise the Lord. Come on, religious freedom. Keep looking. Intolerant of criticism of Islam. I could not do this today in another country. Could not do this. I couldn't do this in some countries that aren't Islamic countries. But they'd haul me off to jail because I'm causing hate speech. I'm not saying anything hateful. I'm not trying to. I'm just putting up stuff on the screen. I think it's true. And it, honestly, if I put something up that's not right, I apologize for it. I can be corrected for it. I'll make a correction if you want me to. I'll do that, okay? Just trying. This ain't what I do for a living. I'm not a scholar. But I would like to educate us somewhat if we could. Amen. In the United States, we have freedom of religious dissent. I want you to thank the Lord for that. Come on, that we don't have to agree. You don't have to get up and go to church. You, you don't have to go to this church. Hey, you're free to do whatever. Islamic states, conversion to Islam only. In America, you have freedom of your conscience. I want you to thank the Lord. I'm not letting you off the hook. You ought to thank God. You ought to thank Him. Freedom of conscience. Islamic state censorship. Can you imagine if you wrote something over there and you, you know if it was, are you kidding me? Scared to death. They can't do that. In America, you have freedom of speech. And I know sometimes it's, it's hard to handle it, but it, thank God for it. Come on, come on. It's hard to handle it, but we thank God for it. We like it when it comes to our speech. Keep looking. Now, I want you to see this. Islamic states, no charity to non-Muslims. Now, I can't just say that none of them do. I don't know that, but this is what I've read. This is what I see in some of the religious writings that you're to give to other Muslims, not to people who aren't Muslims, because you'll be giving to an infidel or some, you know, how you, why you want to do that? That's crazy. So, but the United States is the leader of all charity efforts to everyone worldwide, and I want to put combined, but I ain't sure, but I'm pretty sure it probably is. Let's thank the Lord for that. We lead the way. Are we a Christian nation? Absolutely. Go on, did you tell you, say we're not a Christian nation? Are other countries giving to all these charities like we give? I'd say somebody, somebody somewhere set us up pretty right. Amen. Say, I think it was the Lord. Islamic states are leader of terrorism worldwide. The United States of America is the leading opponent to terrorism worldwide. Let's thank God for that. Amen. The leader, flat out. Trying to fight terrorism everywhere. Amen. So Islam versus Christianity. Is it the same? Do you, feel, do you feel like, not necessarily better, but do you feel like you, Pastor, I understand a lot better. I've got a better, would you say, just to raise your hands, if you feel like, hey, yeah, I think, I mean, you helped today. Now, maybe you already knew all this stuff. If you did, great. Most of us didn't. Here's the bottom line, and I'm done. This is the bottom line for me. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If somebody says, hey, we believe in Jesus. Jesus is in the Quran. We believe in Jesus. He's a prophet. He lived. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in the death of Jesus? And do you believe in the burial of Jesus? And do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior? Do you believe? I'm asking somebody that's a Muslim. Do you believe? Is that what y'all teach? Here's what Islam says about Jesus. Jesus was not crucified. My Lord, your Lord, was not crucified. Did not happen. That's just corrupt scripture. And what was written by Muhammad 
who is illiterate is right and that's wrong. Got it? I don't got it. And I don't like that. That's number one. This is the bottom line for Gary. Number two, Jesus was not buried. Now the Bible says he was buried, but he was not buried. That's just corrupt what the Bible says, okay? He really wasn't buried. That's what they believe. He was not buried. Did y'all hear me yes or no? Number three, Jesus did not resurrect. Though the Bible says he resurrected, though eyewitnesses said he resurrected, though people saw that he resurrected, though the world turned upside down after his resurrection, it really didn't happen because Islam is right and you're wrong. So about Jesus, he was not crucified, he was not buried, he did not resurrect. And he did not take your place or my place on the cross. That's all, it's all wrong, guys. You got it all wrong. So let me get it straight. Jesus didn't die for me. No. He wasn't buried for me. No. Somebody else died on the cross and took his place. He didn't really die on the cross. Somebody else took his place. And what I've read, there's consensus seems to believe out there that it was Judas that died for your sins. How does that make you feel laying down your head tonight on your pillow? Say I know this is a little strong, guys, but this is my bottom line. I reject the teachings of the Koran. And I re yeah, and I don't, I'm not saying that for applause. I reject Islam. Why? Because you took everything away from me that I put my faith in. Jesus. For me, it's all about Jesus. Like the guys saying. It's all about you, Jesus. You took away my Savior, His death, His burial, and resurrection. And He didn't die on the cross for me. Well, you know what? I choose to keep my faith. And if it means giving my life for my faith, I'll give my life for my faith. Because when you take my faith, you take my hope. You take my peace. You take my prayers. You take everything away from me. And I refuse to let that happen. I'm going to keep my faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have an adversary, the devil. He's out there. He's destroying and wants to destroy our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's the bottom line for me. Jesus said that he would be crucified. He said it ahead of time. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. The writers of our scriptures say that Jesus died for you and me. What am I going to believe? Are they the same? Yes or no? They're not the same. Are y'all hearing me today? And again, are we to love all people? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. That's because we put it up today, right? Absolutely. But I'm not to accept, to accept everything somebody says. And that goes for Christian folks as well. Christian people will screw you up too. You hear me? Compare to Scriptures. But listen, there's no comparison here. And i got to quit. I've already read these scriptures. Raj, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. We're doing good. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Say it with me. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the... So who are you going to believe? I believe the Bible. 1,500 years, 40 authors, consistent history in the text. I believe in Jesus. Amen? I want to follow in the legacy of his followers, servers, not warriors and killers. Amen? And we're free in this country because somebody came before us and believed in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Wow! Fellowship meets every Sunday morning on our beautiful 15 and a half acre campus in the Bullseye of Rotunda, West Florida at 140 Rotunda Boulevard West.
Early worship begins at 8.30 a.m., with our morning worship service beginning at 10.30 a.m. Between these two services, we offer gourmet coffee, fresh juices, pastries, and lots of fellowship free of charge in our hospitality center. If you are looking for a church in the Inglewood area or would just like to pay us a visit, we would love to fellowship with you. For more information, give us a call at 941-475-7447 or log on to fcinglewood.com. For Pastor Gary Clark and all of us at Fellowship, God bless you.